Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Louise Byrne, and I'm head of Brexit division in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, which is the latest in a series of webinars we're running to help businesses prepare for the changes that are going to come around on the 1st of January. Today's webinar is a, a uh, ho uh, jointly hosted with our colleagues in DEFRA in the UK and it's titled Moving Animals and Agri-Food Goods to, from and through Great Britain from the 1st of January 2021, Your Product Journey. Um, I want to welcome James Sharples from uh, DEFRA and his colleagues who are on, on the line. I also want to welcome colleagues from the Revenue Commissioners in Ireland and colleagues from my own department who are here to um, present to you and to answer any questions that you have. In terms of the running order for today's um, event, we're going to start off with the Department of Agriculture um, presenting a high-level overview of our import control process, um, followed by product journeys into Ireland, and then we'll have a questions and answers on those um, uh, uh, presentations. We'll then have a short presentation from our colleagues in the Revenue Commissioners um, uh, on exports from Ireland, and, and that's on the customs uh, uh, formalities. Then we will um, move to um, DEFRA, where we'll have a, a presentation from colleagues in DEFRA. Again, a high-level overview of the import controls that the UK will apply um, uh, from the 1st of January next year, followed by product journeys into the UK. So to flip things on their head, um, our imports will be uh, the export requirements for people who are listening in from the UK and vice versa. Um, the UK import requirements will be uh, the export requirements for uh, Irish businesses who are listening in from Ireland. Then um, we'll have questions and answers. and. Um, Lastly, then, we're going to give you, uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine are going to give you a presentation on the land bridge. And we're going to look at two product journeys from Ireland across GB to France and then from France uh, across GB back into Ireland, followed by uh, uh, questions and answers. So um, just to, to maybe set the scene, we are uh, four weeks away from the 1st of January when the UK will leave the EU Single Market and Customs Union, whatever the outcome of the EU-UK negotiations, which are uh, at a very sensitive stage. This will mean substantial change. The UK's departure from the EU means that goods imported from, exported to or transiting through Great Britain will now be subject to customs and regulatory controls, including sanitary and phytosanitary checks. The protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland will apply from the 1st of January, ensuring that these changes to our trade with Great Britain will not apply to trade with Northern Ireland. Given the volume of trade um, between Ireland and Great Britain, implementing these new requirements has required substantial investment uh, in infrastructure, staff and resources, procedures and IT systems at our ports and airports. It has also required substantial investment by businesses. And it is really essential that businesses make those preparations for those new rules and requirements now. Anybody involved in trading between Ireland and Great Britain needs to be in a position to complete those customs and regulatory formalities so that they can continue to trade from the 1st of January. Failure to have those preparations in place before the end of the year will mean delays and difficulties for the companies concerned and for trade generally on the 1st of January. There are a wide range of financial upskilling and advisory supports available on our websites uh, on gov.ie and also on the DEFRA and the UK Gov websites and I would encourage people to avail of those supports where they can. So without further ado I'm going to um, pass over to um, Noreen Galvin who is uh, an inspector in our Import Control Operations Division, and she is going to present on Ireland's uh, import control processes, give a high-level overview. So I, I'm going to hand over to Noreen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. 
Um, so I'm going to give a, an overview on the import controls process as it pertains to the movement of goods and animals from GB into Ireland. So as Louise already said, um, the EU regulations are going to apply from the 1st of January 2021 for goods that are moving from Great Britain, regardless of whether there is a trade deal. So all live animals, products of animal origin, including fishery products, regulated plant and plant products that are imported into the EU from GB will require an import controls process at the border control post of entry into the EU. And in this case, it would be Dublin Port, Russell Airport, Dublin Airport, Shannon Airport, are our BCPs in Ireland. The checks are mandatory and the they aim to reduce the risk to human, animal and plant health from the import of these products from third countries into the EU. So what exactly is the import controls process? It, it pretty much follows a standard regime of checks. And the, the first one, the most important one for us, and the, the one that you have most control over getting correct is the documentary check. 100% of consignments of live animals, products of animal origin and plant and plant products are subject to documentary checks and we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what's necessary for that. Then moving on the second phase, the identity check phase, 100% uh, of products of animal origin require an identity check and 100% of live animals will require an identity check also. The physical check, 100% of live animals will require physical checks on entry into the EU and this will include a welfare check on the animal and um, welfare transport requirements as well. A varying percentage of products of animal origin will have a physical check and a varying percentage of regulated plant and plant, plant products will be subject to a combined identity of, and physical check and this is on a risk, risk assessment basis. So how can we prepare? So documentation needed to prepare for your import. So for the products of animal origin, a health certificate is required for entry into the EU. It needs to be the correct model for the commodity that you want to import and the correct model for the commodity that's being certified. It must be certified by an official veterinarian in the country in which it is being exported from. So in this case, Great Britain. And we also want to discuss the um, option of whether there would be a competent authority seal on the load and hence referenced in the health certs that are on that load. For the plants and plant products, we require for some of the regulated plants and plant products, we require a phytosanitary certificate and that will be certified by an authorised officer in the exporting country, in this case GB. For equines and, and live animals in general, general with a, um, some specific info on the equines, the health certificate is required for entry in CEU. We need to make sure it's the correct model for the type of equine movement that is going on. So if it's a temporary or a permanent import. Um, the, um, in the case of non-registered equity, they will also require government issued supplementary travel ID. Both of these assert and the ID will be certified by the official veterinarian and will also require the um, horse's passport. So just another important phase. So now we've talked about we've talked about what documents are required. The next important phase is to decide who is going to be the operator responsible for the consignment. And this applies to plant to plant products, products of animal origin and live animals. And they're a very important person in the import controls process when it comes to moving goods into the EU. And it can be the importer themselves or an EU-based agent acting on behalf of the importer. The most important thing is that they must be registered with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and then subsequently they'll be registered on TRACES, which is the EU's import um, platform. What are the responsibilities of the operator responsible for the consignment? And what must they have access to? So importantly, they need to have access to all the necessary paperwork from either the British supplier or via the EU importer. Their main role is to pre-notify the border control post of entry 24 hours in advance by generating a common health entry document for each consignment on traces. So it could be a shed A for a live animal, a shed P for a product of animal origin, or a PP for plant and plant products. They also need to, so in also, after they have generated their shed, they need to submit the documents to the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine 24 hours in advance. And that's in advance of the load presenting to the border control post. And we require, in order to carry out our documentary check, we require a copy of the health cert or the phytosanitary certificate. 
the details of the common health entry document. For fishery products, we will require the catch certificate, and then that makes its way to the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority to confirm compliance with um, the, um, to make sure that it's regulated fishing requirements. They also require customs reference number and supporting documents, and we ask for a packing list commercial invoice in this case. The operator responsible for the consignment is the point of contact for the border control post staff. So if we have any queries, we revert to the operator responsible for the consignment, i.e. the person who has submitted the paperwork. And this operator responsible for the consignment is billed for the um, fees associated with the import controls process. So now we have our documents. The operator responsible for the consignment has submitted them and the border control post staff can start doing their documentary checks. And the idea of the pre-notification period of 24 hours allows for the documentary checks to be carried out prior to the load or the live animal arriving in the border control post. So we will use the common health entry document, the health certificates, the phyto certificates and the supporting documents. For fishery products, we also need the verification from the SFPA that it's um, IUU compliant the catch was IUU compliant. Again, I stress all queries would be directed to the operator responsible for the consignment. So once we're happy that the health certificates have been completed correctly, the attestations are correctly um, um, deleted or left in, the details on the health certificates um, and, the, and the health entry document and the supporting documents all marry up, um, we would um, we would say that the documentary check is is complete, but it actually it wouldn't be complete until we see the original health certificate, and we'll talk about that later. But it allows us to further process your load. So once completed, the consignment is assigned an identity check or an identity and a physical check for products of animal origin. For plant products, it's a risk-based assessment, so it will be as um, assigned a further check for an ID and physical on a risk basis and all live animals will be rooted for an ID physical and welfare check. And just to point out the original health certificate must travel with the consignment and be presented at the border control post at the time of inspection. And that allows us to complete our documentary check. So just very briefly on the products of animal origin, when we talk about the identity check, and we mentioned a competent authority seal on the load. So for loads that are carrying products of animal origin, if there is a competent authority seal on the load, as you can see in the picture, placed by the um, official veterinarian at the place of dispatch, and that, that, that seal number is referenced on each of the health certificates for that load, then we can do a seal check. And that is something that is an efficient identity check. And we check the number on the seal, and we check that it corresponds to each of the numbers on the original health certificate that the driver presents to us at the time of the inspection. If there isn't a competent authority seal, then we must carry out a full identity check on the load. Um, or at our discretion, we could perform a full identity check even on a seal load. And this requires the load to be put on the loading bay in the border control post and partial turnout of the load um, to gain access to each of the consignments in order to cross-reference the markings um, and to make sure that the commodity is as what it says in the, in the health certificate. Moving on then, the next stage would be a physical check. And as we said, the rate varies with the type of product being imported. For products for the product of animal origin, again, it is put on the loading bay. We have a full or partial turnout of the load, uh, depending on how easy it is to access the consignments we need. Um, the physical check includes a full identity check, and we also check the other parameters to ensure that the consignment is fit for, if it's for human consumption, that it's fit for human consumption and entry into the EU. It's at this point that if your consignment is subject to sampling, that we would carry out our sampling. And just to mention, just to draw your attention to the ISP M15 requirements on the wood packaging material um, from the 1st of January. These requirements will apply to goods that are shipped from Great Britain, um, and we will be doing um, we will be doing checks on this at the border control post. With regard to live animals and equines, the identity, physical, and welfare checks will be carried out in the live animal border control post. Um, there's one, and uh, it is in the top right-hand corner of this picture. Um, and there's one also, obviously, in Rossell Airport. This is Dublin Port. Um, and here we carry out the identity checks on the original health certificate. Again, remember the original health certificate must travel with the driver. We carry it out. Uh, we carry out the identity check 
on the original health certificate, the passport, the microchip, and the supplementary ID where it's applicable, so in the case of a non-registered equine. We also carry out a physical and welfare check on the equines and serological testing where appropriate. So on non-registered equines, a small percentage of them would, would be subject to serological testing at the border control post. Once we've completed all our checks, whether it be on a product or on a live animal, we make a decision on the consignment. So assuming everything and all the stages have been compliant, we will accept the consignment into the EU and we validate the common health entry document on traces. So the shed A, the shed PP or the shed P, whichever is appropriate. Customs are informed and the consignment is free to leave the border control post. In a situation where non-compliance has been detected, um, we then would consider the refusal, refusal or rejection of that consignment. And rejections can occur at any phase of the import controls process. And as I mentioned earlier, the documentary check is, is so important. It's the one area where you can see in 2017 on the stats at the border control post in Dublin, um, rejections, 67% of the rejections were due to documentary errors. And it's the one area that you have control over you know, that, you know, just submitting correct, accurate documentation in a timely fashion. Um, once we once we detect non-compliance, these consignments are not allowed to enter the EU. And the option then for, the option for the importer would be to return that consignment to the country of origin, to destroy it, or to treat the consignment in a manner specified by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And that would be more, um, that would be more suitable for plant and plant health products. Um, it's worth mentioning that um, you need to have a plan in place to deal with rejected consignments because um, DEFRA will require notification of returning of these consignments on their IPAF system, uh, whether it's an equine, a live animal or um, a consignment of product of animal origin. So this is something you need to have thought about, discussed with your UK supplier about having access to IPAFs to, to, to um, return your consignment if that's the option you choose. If you choose to destroy it, it'll be incinerated and the fees for storage and destruction of your consignment will be um, should be paid or met by the operator responsible for the consignment. So just that was a bit of a whirlwind, but just a key just key points in summary. So with regard to products of animal origin, verify with your supplier in Great Britain that your products can be certified in the UK for EU import. With regard to your equines, talk to your agent in the UK or talk to your vet well in advance of wanting to move your equine to make sure they can meet the serological, the residency, the isolation requirements for the certificate you need. Decide who will be the operator responsible for the consignment to handle all the paperwork and to provide the pre-notification, the all important documents and pre-notification to the border control post. For products, assess your freight presentation. If you have the option of a seal load, um, that is great. That gives you the option of a seal as an identity check. Groupage and mix loads. We understand that they are necessary, but just we would have, just to just to make you understand that by their nature and complexity, they are slower to process through the different stages of the import controls process. And just to remember again, ensure the original health certificate travels with the load. Um, so. The next slide has some links, et cetera, and uh, I'm sure these will be um, these will be available at the end of our talk as well. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Noreen. Um, I'm going to move on uh, straight away to uh, some of the product journeys and Kevin Foley-Field from my division is going to present on those. Um, we are seeing the questions as they're coming in. We will address those uh, uh, questions um, uh, once Kevin has finished his presentation. And um, uh, I've been asked that maybe people just slow down in terms of the delivery. There is a lot of information um, to, to be digested. So um, just to let everybody know, we will be making this, um, uh, this webinar is being recorded. It will be put up on gov.ie forward slash agriculture. And I'm sure our DEFRA colleagues will confirm that it will be available through DEFRA's um, uh, website as well. Um, and uh, there will not be a transcript, but we will make available the slides afterwards. So I just ask colleagues just to bear those um, uh, things in mind when they're delivering, please. So handing over to Kevin Foley-Free. Thank you. 
thanks, thanks, Louise. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm Kevin Volley Quill. I'm an analyst in the Brexit division in the department. And I suppose uh, today we're just going to talk briefly about a, a few product journeys to show how goods will move from Ireland, uh, from Great Britain even, into Ireland after the end of the transition period. Um, I suppose we're not going to go through all these in detail, but we'll cover the first one from start to finish. Uh, and just for convenience, we're going to focus on Dublin Port, but broadly similar procedures will apply to Ross Lair as well. I suppose after we look at cheddar, we'll look at some of the other commodities and how the journey varies between cheddar, beef, cod, pepperoni pizza, some carrots, and finally a registered thoroughbred horse. Uh, this will hopefully provide a, kind of a sort of broad high-level overview uh, to give a sense of the import control processes and how to comply with them from the 1st of January. And I suppose it's worth pointing out and reiterating again that uh, the, all of the EU's import control requirements will apply in full from the 1st of January. There, there is a transition period and we are currently in it. Um, if we look first at Cheddar, the very first step here that has to be complied with is that the UK must be listed as an approved country which can export the bogs spam large into the EU. Uh, the Cheddar must also be sourced from an approved establishment. Without this, the product journey um, of this cheese stops before it has a chance to start. Assuming those two things are in place, we then need to ensure that the person responsible for the consignment is registered. We we'll need an EORI number and they all must also be registered correctly with DAF and Man for Choices. You'll see the link to register with DAF at the bottom of the slide. Uh, this is the start of the journey. It hasn't gone anywhere yet. These are the steps that must be taken before you even consider the potential for moving the product from the UK and Ireland. Now we're going to look at what happens to Cheddar and this sample of product journey, we're going to assume that the cheese is coming from Hollyhead and it's going to Dublin Port. Uh, I suppose that the, that's just a kind of an high level overview of the, uh, the steps that will be taken with the cheese starting in Wales, moving through Hollyhead into Dublin Port and then finally being released into the uh, EU single market in Ireland. Now, before Cheddar boards the ferry, you'll, you'll need a few things. The first is you'll need an export health certificate. The certificate required will vary depending on the category the UK are placed into, but everything you'll need will be up on traces. The authorities in the UK will certify the Cheddar, Cheddar traces, traces even, sorry, is also where you'll fill out the common health entry document or shed. There's also other documentation you'll need that Noreen has referred to earlier, including commercial invoices, packing lists, and so on. Depending on your business processes, you may decide to seal the truck as well. If the seal is placed in the truck carrying the consignment, then it must be placed by the competent authority in the UK and the seal number placed in part one of the shed. All the relevant documentation must be submitted by the operator responsible for the consignment once we have traces and then once again to Daphne's import control system. This needs to happen 24 hours in advance of arrival of the consignment to Dublin Port. If you don't comply with the notice period, you're far more likely to experience delays in Dublin Port. The benefit of early submission is that we can help correct errors. There's also a pre-boarding notification process for customs. This is a type of virtual envelope containing details of all the declarations associated with the vehicle. It's when we use expectation that the party responsible for the vehicle trailer will complete the PBN, but anyone in the supply chain can do that. PBN is completed on the uh, revenue website and the ID is to be shared with the driver and others in the supply chain. You'll be able to check before boarding if the PBN is good to check in and if you're able to board. If the PBN doesn't have a good to check in status, then it won't be permitted to board the ferry. Now on arrival into Dublin Port, when the, while the treader is travelling across the Irish Sea, Daffin will have started the documentary check thanks to receiving the documents 24 hours in advance. The driver of the consignment will be able to look up his routing about 30 minutes before the ship docks in Dublin Port. As you can see in our example here, the treader has received a call to custom seal check. So it'll follow signage once it leaves the ferry for Terminal 7. There's a toll booth-like structure in Terminal 7 which conducts staff from seal checks. We're going to assume that our treader is in a truck which has been sealed and it has not been selected for a full identity check as no one's outlined earlier. The truck will move through the toll booths and it's here the documentary check will be finalized. The, the, the seal check will also be conducted and assuming everything is in order, that will complete the inspection process. A formal decision, formal decision even, sorry, will be made by the official veterinarian as to whether to clear or reject the consignment. And once completed, the truck will be free to leave the port. And that's essentially a very high level overview of the first sample journey for that cheddar. We'll, uh, we'll cover a few other scenarios uh, as we're here. On the uh, movement of fresh or chilled beef, we'll see that's essentially the same process of we've, as we've just talked about for cheddar. The country needs to be approved, the plant needs to be approved, the person responsible for the consignment needs to have an EORI number, it must be registered with DAFM, must be up on traces, all the customs requirements are, are broadly the same. 
Key difference though is that the certificate required is different. Again, though, this, this will be up on traces. It might be worth mentioning that the physical examination um, process at this point uh, will, will, will vary. Different products of animal origin have different frequency rates that apply to physical examinations. Uh, these range um, from 1 to 100 percent, depending on the, the type of commodity. And let's uh, assume for the purposes of this, this example that our fresh beef has been flagged for a physical inspection on arrival into Dublin Port. So if the consignment is flagged for a physical inspection, it will receive a call to customs routing. So here our consignment of fresh, fresh beef has been flagged accordingly. It will follow the same pattern as the ones going for a seal check, but instead of going to Terminal 7, it will be directed to Terminal 11 instead. There it will park and check in on revenue system. You'll be advised to wait in your vehicle. Once an inspection facility becomes available, you'll receive a text message indicating the terminal where the inspection is to be carried out. We assume that our consignment of fresh beef gets a message to report for examination in Terminal 10. The driver will take the beef from where it's parked in Terminal 11 to Terminal 10 following signage. Once it arrives in Terminal 10, the staff in the terminal will direct you to an empty bay where you'll open the truck so that staff and officials can examine its contents. That's when the physical inspection process will begin. And just like for the identity check, once cleared, it'll, you'll be free to leave the port directly. Now, next, if we look very uh, briefly at COD, this is broadly the same as other products of animal origin, but there, there is one uh, major difference to note here, and that is that the catch certificate uh, is also required. This has to be submitted to DAFM's import control systems, along with all the other documents required. Ideally speaking, um, uh, the, the catch certificate will be submitted 72 hours in advance, but 24 hours in advance is, is workable. If we move to the next slide there, sorry, on pepperoni pizza. And again, almost all the processes are the same. The key difference here, though, is that this is a composite product and it may not be subject to controls. It depends on what's in it. Some are always subject to controls, such as anything containing processed meat, like our pepperoni pizza, for instance. So we'll be subject to documentary identity and possibly physical controls on arrival. Derogations are applied to certain uh, composite products for various reasons. To check if a derogation applies, you'll need to contact PCP in advance of arrival. Detail on how to apply for that derogation is on or available on our website. Just to note, however, that this, there is a new procedure for this being developed, and that will be released shortly. And once it is, details of that will be available again on our website. Carrots is the next uh, product journey we'll, we'll take a very brief look at. And just before we uh, we get too far into this, it's important to flag that this particular consignment of carrots contains less than 1% soil or growing material. Um, there are a few more differences in this one than the others. First, you'll need to be registered as a professional plant operator with DAFM. And just like for our consignment of uh, fresh cod, the operator must be uh, correctly uh, registered to and submit the factual sanitary certificate um, rather than a health certificate. Uh, the factual sanitary certificate uh, comes from, will come from the National Plant Protection Organization in the UK. And in terms of submitting this document in advance, a color scan copy of the fire sanitary certificate is sufficient, just to make sure that the physical copy makes its way to the uh, fire sanitary certificate section of the department five days after the uh, consignment has been cleared. Uh, consignments of carrots will be subject to 100% documentary checks, and physical checks are carried out on a risk basis. Again, everything else is as you'd expect as we applied for Cheddar. You submit all your documentation on traces and all the documents through DAFM's IT systems and comply with customs formalities as required. Now, our registered uh, thoroughbred horse, uh, the, again, the steps broadly the same. You get your EORI, you register on traces with DAFM, you complete the shed, you get the health certificate, and you submit everything 24 hours in advance um, of, of arrival at the BCP. When you're getting the health certificate for the registered thoroughbred horse, uh, you just be careful that this has to be issued on the last working day before embarkation. This is just for registered horses. Different rules apply to unregistered horses. The process of submission, however, is the same as we've outlined before. Uh, all horses are subject to a physical examination. The type of examination that will be carried out will vary depending on the health status assigned to the UK as a country by the EU. Advan in advance of other Brexit deadlines, the UK has been placed in sanitary group A. This is the most favourable category with limited additional requirements, but all the horses will be stopped and examined in order to go some process. And there you'll see, sorry, the, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines Brexit helpline uh, phone number, an email address where you can contact us as well for a, uh, advice and uh, information, and our website, which has, has more information. 
think that's uh, that's it. I think we're moving along to a uh, questions and answers after this. Yes, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and and there are many questions. Um, so so let me just try and bring this into the middle of my screen. So I'm, I'm going to be calling on colleagues. Um, we, we'll try and get to um, a, a good number of these, but uh, we may not get to them all today. And if we don't, what we'll do is we will answer them and um, we will circulate the answers to those questions um, in the form of an FAQ um, uh, um, after the event, if needed. So, uh, first question: What? Uh, so, sorry, there was a question in relation. I'm not sure if everybody can see the questions and answers. Um, so, I'm just going to repeat some of the ones. Um, so, what are the import fees that will apply um, uh, coming into Ireland? So, Annex Four of uh, Regulation 2017-625 is the official controls regulation. Um, uh, uh, and those fees will apply, and um, uh, we will send you a link to that regulation afterwards. Um, so, what is the criteria for a product needing a, um, a health cert for a product of animal origin? Is there a threshold for animal material content in a composite product below which um, a health cert isn't needed? Or is it that any animal material at at all triggers uh, a health cert. So Noreen or Ruth, can I ask one of you to answer that question, please? Hi Louise, I can I can take that. Um, there, there is very um, clear rules on, on composite products. If they contain any meat at all, then they require health cert. Um, if they require any dairy as well, they require health cert. But there is uh, detailed rules on the website to determine if your composite product contains animal products, requires a health care and official control. So we refer them to look at them in too detailed to discuss it this forum. Okay, th thank you very much. So uh, next question, what is the normal procedure that expected? The UK supplier will complete traces entry of our or Irish or would the Irish importer complete traces? So just Noreen, can you just run back over that? So the operator responsible for the consignment, who who, who completes the traces um, and notification, please? Um, the operator responsible for the consignment must be in the EU. So therefore it is, um, it is most likely that it will be the EU importer that organises for the traces pre-notification. So, so in this case, the importer that's in Ireland will organise the RFC, the person responsible for the consignment, who must must be within the EU to do pre-notification and generate the shed on traces. Okay, there's another question coming in. I think Kevin has answered it. Health certs are not required for goods traveling to GB until April 2021. Well, ju just to clarify, that's for some goods, um, and and um, uh, James and colleagues will, will explain that later on. Um, but just to be clear, the EU rules apply from the 1st of January, so if there's a requirement for a health cert, it is required for the 1st of January, so I'll cut that off at the pass. Um, DEFRA have confirmed that electronic cert certificates continue to be per permitted as introduced due to COVID controls. Um, at ROI BCP, will an original cert be required? So the answer is yes, an original health cert will be required. Um, uh, we have no indication that there will be any um, reasons from a COVID perspective that those certs can't be supplied. And uh, given that the truck can arrive, one would expect that the health cert can arrive as well. Um, uh, we're an importer of food goods from the UK to our, we are an importer of goods um, from the UK to Ireland and we're registered on traces. I've tried to complete the draft sheds on traces but can't locate any current UK produ producer suppliers in the drop down box. So again, this has got to do with the approval from the EU Commission. So maybe Ruth or um, Noreen, could one of you answer that question please? Um, it, it is our understanding, and, and I think maybe our colleagues uh, in DEFRA may be able to confirm that the uh, food establishments in the UK have been put forward for EU approval, but that list is as such referred to as pending, so it's not available publicly yet. But I think maybe that is something our colleagues from DEFRA could, um, could comment on. 
Yeah, so, so the, the process is once the EU approves the country and the, the establishments are then approved, that the establishments are then put up on traces. And it's only when that happens then can uh, the Irish importer see that list of establishments in essence. But yeah, James, maybe you can cover that off when you come in. Um, can you tell us the likely um, uh, uh, status of the tripartite agreement um, between Ireland and GB um, and it applies also to France after the 1st of January 2021. So the TPA falls um, uh, after the transition period. Um, uh, so um, basically the requirements for entering uh, for horses entering Ireland will be the EU requirements. Um, uh, there is work ongoing in relation to um, uh, putting in place bipartite agreements um, and obviously um, uh, with the north of Ireland and, uh, and also with France. But um, for horses coming from GB, they have to um, comply with the EU uh, requirements. Is there an agreed pre-export cert for raw materials that may be produced now in Ireland, but used to form a finished product destined for the UK after the 1st of January. Question in relation to animal origin product. So um, who's the lucky one on my list to deal with that? Can anybody in that in the room, if not, we might come back to that. Ruth or Noreen, we might yeah. have to come back to that if that's okay. Um, uh, where loads have been consolidated at a GB warehouse and a seal on an original uh, certificate has been changed and a new seal applied by an official veterinarian in GB, will amendment to the seal number on the original cert be accepted? So Noreen, can I give that to you, please? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a scenario where this may have been. So um, it, it, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so in that um, if that product was originally certified in a different warehouse, in order to move it to a central warehouse for it to be exported as part of a consolidated load um, and they want to export it with a seal on it and then it would have to be recertified and the new seal applied. And, and the seal number then, at that new seal being recorded on the uh, certificate by the official veterinarian. Okay, that's fine. Sorry, Thank yes, you. Yes, yeah. Um, can you confirm, please, uh, we produce pizza at a factory, put it into separate cases, example, one case of pepperoni, one case of meat feast. We ship them from the factory to the third party here in Ireland, and the third party takes the two separate bales of pizza and packs them into a bale of multi-party, then the two bales fully packaged and pack them together into one pack and into two different pizza types. Gosh, that's nearly too complicated. I'm going to just pass on that. We will come back to the pizzas. But for me, there are requirements for pizzas coming into Ireland. Once they're in and they've cleared the BCP, they're in free circulation. And anybody then can do what they like after that once they get through uh, customs. Is that correct? If any of, of my experts on the line are reading these, if you can short circuit some of this jump in, I'm not going to say no. Um, uh, there's a lot of paperwork. At which stage is the information required digitised? Yes, there is a lot of paperwork. Um, there is provision in the new official controls regulation to moving to um, e-certification, um, and uh, um, but we're not at that space yet. But Look, at, I think COVID this year has shown us that an awful lot of things um, have, have moved to, uh, uh, to digitization. So, um, uh, but at the moment, the requirements as presented are those requirements. Are shipments out of Ireland to the UK registered, required to be registered on traces? We're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll let the UK deal with that. DEFRA colleagues deal with that. So we have a number of questions around wood pallets uh, um, uh, and whether or not, if, if they're not compliant. So can I ask either Cahal Ryan or Emmett Byrne to come in and, and speak to the wood pallet and, and to deal with um, what happens if the pallet is rejected? Um, uh, so maybe colleagues, could you come in on that, please? 
Uh, Louise, I'll come in to start with, but just to reiterate the position that Noreen um, laid out earlier. So it, from the 1st of January, it is a specific import condition for the introduction of wood packaging material into the EU uh, from third countries that it is ISPM 15 compliant. And we've consistently advised traders with the UK, both importers and exporters, of the need to ensure that their wood packaging material that they use in their supply chain is ISPM 15 compliant. Now, the Department, in common with any other European Union competent authority, undertakes checks of wood packaging across all the range of commodities from all the third countries on, a, on the basis of a monitoring plan and on a risk basis. Um, in respect of the United Kingdom, the risk basis for the United Kingdom is not expected to change from the 1st of January 2021. The UK has a high plant health status. Where, however, in, where we do come across cases of non-compliance in, in those inspections of wood packaging material, um, there's a number of options available to a competent authority and how it deals with those non-compliances. Um, uh, uh, and they would, uh, the, the, the considerations there would be the degree of non-compliance and the plant health risk that's pre presented by it. And the options would include refusal of entry, um, the, re the removal and, um, and destruction of the wood packaging material or the treatment of the wood packaging material before release. And I might ask Cahill to add anything else he feels is relevant there. Uh, thanks, Emmett. Uh, no, I think you've, you've covered the options there, um, Emmett, in relation to what the OCR sets down as permissible when there's a non-compliance. So we have destruction, uh, refusal of entry, um, treatment are in certain cases, depending on the risk presented by the material, uh, repackaging, uh, recreating of the material may be acceptable as well. Thanks. Okay, th th thank you very much. Um, we have, uh, there's, a, there's a very detailed question about animal and plant derived products subject to restrictions, example, lactose and garlic powder. So, so like the bottom line, you need to know the CN code of the product that you're importing and you need to then look at the regulations and see what, what those regulations require. If you have specific questions like that, um, we have uh, as th that call centre number and we have that email address if you want to send us in um, some, some questions, we'll try and answer them. Um, uh, there's, there's a question in relation to goods that route GB into Northern Ireland and ROI. So under the Ireland to Northern Ireland protocol, um, the North are applying the EU so the controls that we do in at the border in, in Dublin and in Rosslare and other border control posts, they will apply in the north for goods entering the north. So um, the BCPs will be um, those BCPs that are approved by the Commission um, uh, for, for Northern Ireland. Um, uh, so there's an interesting question, the asked position with regard to health certs being required for e-commerce parcels containing product of animal origin. Um, so this is retailer direct to the consumer from GB to, let's say in our case, let's deal with ROI from the 1st of January. So can somebody deal with that? So where the goods are sent in the post? Noreen, do you want to deal with that? Yeah, I, I can I can take that. There are allowances for personal consignments either directly on the person as they arrive into the country or sent in the post or courier. There are restrictions in that there's no meat allowed, no dairy products allowed, but there are specific allowances for fish and other animal products. Um, they wouldn't require a health certificate and they don't require import control checks at the border control post. Um, but if if that person wants to get in touch with us, we can point, point them in the direction of the specificities of that of those and, and the products that are covered by that and not covered. Okay, there's a number of questions about horses and um, transporter access to offer water or attend a horse on a sealed load. I don't think we're, Catherine Lawler, can I get you to come in? We're not planning on sealing horse boxes. And then um, for uh, Noreen then, um, again, time scale or welfare at border control posts for horses. Have the BCP rehearsed how long it would take um, a, a group which load? So in other words, you'd have maybe 12 different horses um, on, a, a, on a horse um, transporter. Um, and there, there's concern about 
you know, the impact of the length of time of these uh, inspections on uh, journey logs and tachograph driving hours. So maybe we'll start with Catherine and then I'll move to Noreen if that's okay. Hi, thanks Louise. Just as regards vehicles moving with live animals, there's no plan at the moment to seal those vehicles from a welfare point of view. As regards stopping on the land bridge for uh, for whatever reason and checking, we would need DEFRA to comment on that uh, as regards the land bridge controls uh, for crossing the land bridge. Thank you. Okay, Noreen, do you want to talk about how long it takes a uh, uh, lorry of horses to get through the BCP in Dublin? Um, yes, yeah. so look, we are we are acutely aware of the welfare requirements. At no point do we want to um, infringe on those and we will do our utmost to process the animals as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, the live animal border control post is is very, very near the disembarkation for the ferry. So from the point of view of queuing, it is very, very minimal. So once you get to us, you which will be quick, we aim to to process your load as quickly as possible. And if that, that requires, you know, the original health certificates you presented to us, we'll have our paperwork lined up, ready to go, the passports, you, you present the passports to us. Um, so we will do our utmost to process them as quickly as possible. Okay, there's a number of questions around composite products. I'm, I'm going to ask that they're, that they're emailed in. I'm, I'm conscious that time is racing on on us here. And um, there's a question or two for DEFRA and James, and maybe ask you to pick those up in your presentation, please. Um, again, inquiries about how you register for traces, go on to gov.ie forward slash agriculture forward slash Brexit and or, or email the Brexit registrations email address and um, we'll have somebody there that will be able to deal with you uh, to register for traces. Um, uh, again, are Irish companies able to use the UK IPAFs? Again, James, that's for you. Um, uh, does the BCP person take the mobile number for the driver at the BCP or will we have to provide mobile number for each driver on dispatch from the factory? So, Carlan or um, uh, Noreen, do you want to deal with that? Carlan, maybe. Yeah, Carlan is uh, Carlan O'Keefe from the Irish Revenue Commissioners. Thanks, Louise. No, when when the driver um, parks up and does that registration with us um, on the self parking uh, check in screen, they'll give us their mobile telephone number and then we will send an automated message to them telling them what exam area to go to. So from a revenue perspective, that's how the communication will be done to tell the driver uh, where to go to for their exam. Okay. It, it is now uh, 20 past 11. Uh, I'm going to pause on the questions coming in. There are others, uh, some of which are um, for DEF or some of which are for us. I think we'll have to just try and answer all of those questions after the, um, uh, uh, the event. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask Carlan um, uh, to go through kind of the customs requirements for exports out of Ireland. And uh, then, um, then James, I'll ask you to come in and give the presentation from uh, the product journeys and the import controls into uh, the UK or into Great Britain. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. So um, I'm just going to walk you through, and what we're really talking about here is the movement of all what we would call SPS goods, but for all exports, all uh, goods leaving Ireland that are moving by uh, rural ferry in this instance is the example that we have. So on the slide deck you'll see that there are two main uh, features of, from a customs perspective is you will need an export declaration and you will also need what's called a pre-boarding notification for goods that are moving by roll-on roll-off ferry. So um, you'll see there that for the export declaration, that declaration goes into Revenue's AEP system, it's an IT system where you'll submit the export declaration giving details of consignor consignee and uh, the type of goods. And then also and a new um, function that we have is revenues roll on, roll off service and the pre-boarding notification. So they're the two steps that must be followed for outbound goods going to the UK. 
So um, our pre-boarding notification, it's a virtual envelope. It's really will be, be the part of the haulier that will manage this element of the journey. There will be one PBN per vehicle or per trailer, depending on. And inside in that virtual envelope will be the reference numbers for all of the export declarations. So uh, the haulier or whoever in the supply chain is creating it will go into the revenue website. They will insert all of the reference numbers for all of the export declarations. And then it's really critical that that uh, identification number of the PBN is shared with both the ferry operator and the driver. So, um, and of course, any other party in the supply chain. So what we are advising all businesses to do is do not, the hauliers is do not go down to the ferry ports without checking the status of your pre-boarding notification, because you will not be allowed to board the outbound ferry from Ireland to GB unless you have a good check-in status. So you can just see on the screen there, I mean, it's just um, gives you an idea. This one has a good check-in status. You can go in, you check that online, and um, only on the basis of a good check-in status will you be allowed to board the ferry in Ireland. So then um, on the UK side, the information that has been shared by HMRC with us uh, in relation to customs requirements is that for the first six months, there will be no safety and security entry requirements into the UK. Um, where a UK customer is responsible for the customs formalities and that customer is availing of the simplifications being offered by HMRC, then uh, the only requirement for that driver then in go entering the UK is to have the ORI number of the importer in the UK. So from that point of view, from customs, it's, it's nice and light. Uh, if the Irish customer is actually responsible for all of the UK formalities, then an import declaration into uh, HMRC's IT system will be required. So that's uh, the package of customs requirements for you. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, Carlan.